Uh, welcome to your video on topic 5.15, which is sustainable agriculture. We're also folding in a study form simulation debrief. Um, I'm just going to point out a few things you should have gotten out of your simulation. You will have all this information in the um, paperwork that you filled out when you were done with the simulation. All right, so um, uh, revisit uh, sustainable range, range land management. Notice that uh, the different techniques that you can use to prevent overgrazing, uh, rotational grazing, which should make sense. Uh, you only allow the animals to eat in a certain place at a certain time. Now, as you look at all of this stuff, especially from a free response perspective, be able to do the pros and the cons. The pros are you're, you're, you're using the grass in a sustainable fashion. The con is right here, small groups of cattle. This is going to cut into your profit. This does take time. Uh, the, the portable vent fencing, you have to think that you have to uh, put it down in such a fashion that it is not going to be bumped along by the animals because they will quickly figure out if it's not put in place that they can kind of push it to get to new grass. Uh, so pros and cons there. Then uh, you can also see to keep uh, livestock out of riparian zones that you can uh, move cattle around by providing supplemental feed at selective sites and strategically locating watering ponds that you've built or, or tanks and salt blocks so to keep them out of those riparian zones. The implication now all, all animals need some salt which is why you just put out blocks of salt for them to lick. <clears throat> the implication being that they get some of that from salt that'll build up on the, the edges of streams and uh, streams and rivers. So but again the cons are this takes planning, this takes money, this takes supervision in order to do those things as well. So um, let's see, page 360. Our next question is define and differentiate between the following agricultural topsoil management techniques. There is a lot going on in these two pages. So do, it's not enough to, again, define. Welcome to AP. You need to make sure that you know uh, why one is different from the other and in what situations you use each one. So the, uh, let me just literally do the larger picture here. We're going to be talking about the methods that are, are listed here. You've got terracing, uh, contour planning, strip cropping, and uh, also, uh, this is also intercropping, excuse me, so this is contour planting and strip cropping, intercropping, and then windbreaks uh, between crop fields and I'm uh, going to talk about some no-till planting and then a little bit farther on we're going to talk about crop rotation. So let's go ahead and get through all of this. These techniques became more popular after things like the, the Dust Bowl, which arose because of poor uh, topsoil management. So uh, for example, terracing, just the, the definition is right here, involves converting steeply sloped land into a series of broad, nearly level terraces that run across the land's contours. Uh, this is very good on steep slopes. Basically, you're making steps. So think about all of the things that can uh, occur here that will prevent soil erosion. So each terrace retains water for crops. So instead of just running down the side of a mountain, you go and it, you have the opportunity in those flat places to give the water time to go ahead and percolate down into the soil. And then a little bit more, percolate down the soil. So you're giving the water opportunities to be uh, absorbed by uh, each terrace or step. Uh, so it says it right here, by controlling runoff. Uh, when you have a slope, but it's not that steep, that's where you have contour planting, uh, planting. Instead of insisting on straight rows, you go ahead and kind of follow the curves, uh, the natural curves of the, of the land. And instead of going up and down a mountain, you go ahead and kind of curve, uh, curve around that hill, not a mountain, but around a hill. Again, each row acts as a small dam to help hold topsoil by slowing runoff. You give that water an opportunity to uh, infiltrate into the soil as opposed to just running across the soil. Strip cropping is the same thing, helps to reduce erosion. <clears throat> and to re this, is, this is what makes strip cropping, cropping different from contour planting. Strip cropping uh, is useful even on flat, uh, flat areas, especially where you have a lot of wind. But to me, this is the more important part. And to restore soil fertility with alternating strips 
um, of a row crop, which means that it grows up, leaving some of the soil exposed, and another crop that completely covers the soil called a cover crop. A cover crop. Now this is uh, not mentioned in here, but I will tell you things like alfalfa and clover are uh, associated with um, our, our, excuse me, our, they're not a part of the legume family, but they are very similar to the legume family in that nitrogen fixing bacteria are associated with the roots of alfalfa and clover. So um, the cover crop traps topsoil that erodes and catches and reduces water runoff. And in the case of alfalfa and clover, um, they, uh, the roots also help to enhance, uh, or the bacteria associated with the roots, roots help to enhance the nitrogen that's in the soil. Now, oats and rye are a type of grain. Those will be harvested. Um, alfalfa and clover are oftentimes just uh, tilled back into the soil. I'm not gonna hold you responsible for that on the test. I will, or the quiz, excuse me, I will cover that again before the test. Uh, but tilling it back into the soil means that all of that, that green matter that's been created then acts as a kind of um, that, that dead and decaying plant matter that will eventually uh, de decay enough to release its nutrients back into the topsoil. So again, strip crops, uh, you have one crop that grows up straight, uh, and then the other crop completely covers the ground. So that way, if you have any runoff from the crops that grow up straight, uh, the, the, the cover crops on either side are going to go ahead and keep that soil from going far. Um, another type is called alley cropping. Um, again, one or more crops, uh, uh, usually legumes or another that add nitrogen, are planted in alleys between orchard trees. So here is how this is different. Um, orchard trees are things that, that give fruit that you pick off leaving the tree behind. In other words, uh, corn is an annual crop. That means that you cut the whole thing down and then start anew again the next year. Uh, fruit trees, once you plant them and you take care of them, they will provide fruit year after year after year. You only pick the fruit, you don't cut down the entire tree. So uh, what ends up happening here is that uh, the, the plants in between the rows of trees uh, add nitrogen to the soil, and then uh, the trees themselves uh, provide a, a windbreak so that uh, and wind and rain doesn't wash the topsoil away. Um, and also that shade, again, uh, reduces water loss by evaporation. Um, now what you can do is instead of doing tree um, uh, legume, tree legume, you can simply have uh, your field in the middle and then plant trees all along the outside. So instead of alleys, which is, you know, think like a bowling alley, um, these are called uh, windbreaks or shelter belts. So it's it's the same idea. Instead of the tree being the focus, it's the crop that's the focus. And then this tree um, slows down wind that blows across the field. This is would be incredibly important, or excuse me, useful in like the Midwest where it's windy all the time. Um, so uh, and and in addition, uh, retain soil moisture. Um, uh, and, and it's a secondary, it's, it says supplies wood for fuel, but also if you plant orchard trees, uh, you can get fruit from them instead. But to me, this is, this is uh, and also to you, this should be really important. Provides habitat for birds and insects that help with pest control and pollination, which would also be true of, of alley cropping. You're basically creating um, micro habitats for organisms that are uh, ultimately going to help you in your fields uh, for them to live. So uh, then we also have another way to uh, greatly reduce topsoil erosion is to uh, eliminate or minimize the plowing and tilling of topsoil. If you remember, we saw what that looked like in class and it's called basically no-till farming. So basically here's what happens. You, uh, let's say, grow corn. You cut off the corn stalk, you leave the roots in the ground, which is uh, what's called crop residue. And then if you're uh, have one of those machines that harvests the actual ears off of the stalks. It then shoots the ground up stalks into the ground behind it as it moves forward. If you remember the, the carrot um, harvesting machine we saw kind of did that with the tops of the carrots. That's all crop residue. So think about it. Between the roots and then 
the uh, parts of the plant that you don't want that just sit on top, that acts as a mulch, which keeps the soil in place, keeps moisture in the ground, and then as it decays, it adds nutrients back into the ground. Now, instead of going back and um, retilling the soil, you just simply have a, uh, literally a drill that drills seeds uh, and fertilizer directly through the crop residue onto the ground into a minimally deserved soft soil. And this is another thing that mulch does. Uh, it, well, this says weeds are controlled with herbicides. If you have enough of that crop residue on the ground, you're not gonna get weeds that don't have a place to grow. Um, as you can see here, it increases crop yields and greatly reduces soil erosion. Um, again, prolonged drought because it keeps moisture in the soil. Uh, the drawback here is, is the, the, I guess you do have to use more herbicide than normal um, <clears throat> to return to plowing. Um, let's see what else it says over here on this page. However, also think about it this way. If you use a genetically modified plant that produced its own herbicide, then you wouldn't have to worry about doing that. What is hydroponics? It is growing plants without soil. You simply grow them in water that uh, contains enough nutrients for them to grow. Now this is amazing. Not only do you grow them in water, you grow it in such a way that you have two crops together. So if you have a tank with fish in it and then you have salad greens growing on the top, you can see wastewater from the fish, uh, nourishes the plants, and then the plant roots filter the water, which is then returned to the fish. Um, they actually sell on uh, various online uh, venues. You can get a 40 gallon tank where you can actually do this at home. Uh, this, this closed loop chemical free aquaponic system again conserves soil, water, and energy. Uh, but you can see here <laughs> 100,000 tilapia and perch, which are our farm raised fish. That's amazing. So, this is a um, pretty, pretty cool thing. So, let me look at the core case study. This kind of stuff fascinates you, or if you ever considering doing agriculture, um, definitely take a look at that. So right here, he, this is the dude who did this, and then what's really cool about this is it looks like he's doing this in a food desert, which is an urban area where people have little or no easy access to grocery stores. So um, what is super cool about this and let me see what city this is in um, looks like Milwaukee Wisconsin so uh, educational program oh this is really cool I wish we had something like this nearby very awesome the um, so this actually hits a lot of high points there it is uh, incredibly conservative I excuse me incredibly um, sustainable and then if you're doing this in, in like it said an urban food desert where you don't have a lot of fresh fish or fresh vegetables you're really serving a uh, quality need you're providing uh, right at the peak of harvest um, it doesn't have to travel very far to get to you uh, food that that's your body can use its nutrients to uh, you know to, to do its thing so um this is not a law that you have to know, but do you realize again, um, now this is an actual uh, good one here, a uh, good law to receive subsidy payments for taking highly erodible land out of production and planting it, basically planting with, it, uh, with stuff that's going to help replenish the nutrients in the soil and leaving it alone for, for 10 to 15 years. So this is basically a fixing of land that we messed up in the first place. 10 to 15 years sounds like a long time for you, but uh, in the scheme of things, that's the blink of an eye. Uh, the planet can fix itself if we let it and give it a little bit of help. So uh, what are the three major nutrients contained within fertilizer? We had talked about this before. Uh, it's NPK. N is the chemical symbol for nitrogen. P is the chemical symbol for phosphorus. And K is the chemical symbol for potassium. I do expect that you're able to identify those things. Uh, do you know about the different kinds of organic fertilizers. Organic does not mean healthy. Organic in this case um, means containing carbon. So these are produced and these also are produced in places other than the lab. Everything is chemicals so please don't go with that. Uh, you have animal manure, 
Um, you can see cattle, horses, poultry, and other farm animals. Uh, make sure that you read this. It's not just about adding nutrients back into the soil. Um, it's about improving the topsoil structure. What that means is it's not all compacted. You have different particles giving roots uh, the air pockets they need to do their thing. And then you can see stimulates the growth of beneficial soil and bacteria. Green manure is um, green ve vegetation that's plowed into the topsoil. This is what I was talking about before. When you grow a crop specifically to be ground up, um, why do you want humus in there? Because that uh, holds, and not only is there nutrients, but it also holds a lot of water so it doesn't just run through to the subsoil and then compost this is where you take more non-traditional things uh, partially break them down uh, with the help of microorganisms and sometimes macroorganisms like worms and um, then this creates a, a kind of um, topsoil that you can then uh, work and, and, and till back into the soil so um, you can see again these folks depend on a large pile of compost this is really cool. Um, he takes food that normally would be thrown away, and then he creates um, his own topsoil. And this is another cool thing right here. The, pro the process of decomposition produces heat, so he also uses this process to heat up his greenhouses. Uh, greenhouses are basically houses made out of glass that act a lot like the gases in our troposphere. Um, they let in light. Um, light becomes... Um, uh, it agitates the air particles to create heat, and then the glass traps that heat within the greenhouse. Um, so, I mean, not only is this sustainable and that you're kind of using and reusing what your environment gives you, think about how much money this dude is, is saving. He's getting scraps for free, and it's turning into the soil that he's using. And then the process of decomp is heating up his greenhouses, so he's not having to pay to keep... Um, these grow houses in Wisconsin warm in the wintertime. So again, it's, uh, this is not just good for the environment, it's also good for your wallet. Um, how can worms help to improve soil health? Um, you can see right in here, um, they uh, convert, uh, rapidly convert things to uh, plant nutrients. Uh, something that's not in here, I won't hold you accountable in the quiz, is that red wigglers also with their burrowing create those air pockets in the soil. Um, that allow roots to do their thing. Um, how can crop rotation improve soil health? So we've got that right here. Uh, we degrade soils when we plant crops such as corn and cotton in the same land several years in a row. Um, that really, nitrogen goes really quick. So how do you deal with it? You plant a series of different crops in the same areas. So if you've got a square, you have A, B, C, D, and then maybe in the next year you have A, B, C, D, and so on and so forth. Um, again, legumes, which are things like beans and peas, the roots do not add nitrogen to the soil. It is the bacteria associated with them that does the nitrogen fixation. Please make sure you differentiate that if you're ever asked that in a free response question. Um, what is a drawback to using synthetic fertilizer from a soil health perspective? Uh, while these fertilizers can, fertilizers can replace depleted inorganic nutrients, they do not replace organic matter. Uh, completely restoring topsoil nutrients requires both inorganic, which is the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and organic fertilizer. Um, because it's not just the nutrients that are in there. Remember, it's the structure. Uh, not only uh, air pockets, but then you have that material that has a water, um, uh, water holding quality. That means that, that when you water, it doesn't just run through and you end up with something like a soil salinization. It it's like a sponge. It, it keeps the water around the roots where it's needed, and then it, it's released as, as the soil around it gets dry and used up, uh, the water gets drawn out by the roots. Um, let's see. Uh, remember what the Haber-Bosch process is. That is the process by which we make inorganic fertilizer. Nitrogen is drawn out of the air and converted to ammonia and ammonium ion, well, ammonia, because there's no water, so it's NH3. Um, and what can happen to aquatic ecosystems when nutrient-rich runoff enters the water as a result of over-fertilization. So you over-fertilize, it rains, fertilizer washes into a body of water. Remember, if there's algae in there, uh, algae grow, go, grows crazy, you know, a ton of it, but then it dies. Um, and then when it dies, the decaying bacteria in the water, they go nuts, but they need oxygen to do their thing. So they pull all the oxygen, dissolved oxygen out of the water, 
leaving what's called a hypoxic zone, uh, which is an oxygen-free zone, which then means the fish do not have enough oxygen in order to uh, live, and they, and they die. All right, um, city farm simulation debrief. You're going to have your papers to look at, but just as a reminder as to what you should have gotten out of this, um, definitely, uh, you don't have to know how much water all of these different things use, but remember the, the, what these uh, beans do for you. You have those bacteria that are associated with the roots of legumes, and anytime you planted this, you should have noticed that the soil health goes up. When you were planting, you should have also gotten some sort of warning that you needed to rotate here. Um, also, some of you left a plot empty, and you found that that was a really good strategy to uh, revitalize your soil. That's called letting the plot lie fallow, F-A-L-L-O-W. That means without anything in it. Sometimes just leaving a part of your land alone rejuvenates the soil. The problem, of course, with that is you're not earning any profit from that either. And that's where understanding that you get a, um, a slow and gradually better profit over the years as opposed to a lot of profit now, and then uh, your soil is no longer good for you anymore, and then you've got to go somewhere else. So um, again know what the beans do, understand crop rotation here, and then even letting uh, one of your plots lie fallow. Um, you also needed to make sure that you understood what all of the, um, uh, the add-ons do for you. Chickens primarily in here were uh, used as a pest control method, but hopefully it's also obvious that their uh, poop could be harvested to go ahead and work into the soil to enrich it. Um, and not that this has to do anything with this, but you would also have a side hustle because um, female chickens would lay eggs, and then um, if they got too old to lay, you could then also um, harvest some for a meal for yourself. A composter, um, as I'm sure you remembered, enhanced the, uh, the soil quality through uh, nutrition, and then also uh, water retention. Commercial fertilizer, remember that's only going to be good for putting a nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium back into the soil. It's not going to do anything for the soil structure. Drip irrigation, as I'm sure you remember, is the most efficient sort. Underground uh, puts water at the roots. Um, lime, this is a way of balancing pH. So let's say you get too acidic. Uh, lime is, is basic, and it makes the soil to pH that maximizes um, plant growth. Mulch uh, straight up um, prevents weed growth. It also protects the soil from frost. It also uh, keeps um, uh, moisture in the soil. And then as it decays, it returns uh, nutrients back to the soil. Rain catchment means that as it rains, you're catching water in the barrel and then you can use it when you have a drought and maybe it's not raining next time. So this is a, a, a sustainable way of using water. So instead of pulling it out of your normal water supply, you've just saved it from before. And then worms we talked about already. Um, uh, their poop enriches the soil. Um, they also provide those air pockets that uh, roots need in order to be able to do their thing. So make sure that you revisit that again. And that is the sum total of sustainable agriculture.